Do you need to find the skills to How would you tell people that this is? You first, first, first. How would you tell this? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on that. Hey there, YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. We are once again back to talk about Jeffrey Tompkins. Jeffrey Tompkins, of course, is an Institute for Creation Research uh, researcher, um, misinformer, mendacious sack of I don't know, one of those. Pick whichever one's your favorite. Anyway, last time he was telling us how it is that uh, the fact that there are more mechanisms to evolution than Darwin would have proposed is somehow evidence that uh, evolution is collapsing. Because if there's one way to tell that a scientific theory is on the outs, it's when people are continually adding new observations to it and integrating them fully into the theory and then using those to make further predictions without invalidating the theory. Yeah, that's how you tell that a theory is on the way out, right? Anyway, let's see what else he has for us. Tompkins, take it away. So in other words, evolution now has no mechanism and even evolutionists are recognizing that they've got a huge problem. And of course, we don't see evolution happening now, and I put these pictures up because they're kind of humorous, but we don't see this kind of thing going on in the present world, nor do we see any mechanism that would allow this to happen. Gee, why are there no chimeras combining Cuvier's dwarf caiman, Paleosuchus palpebrosus, and the Taiwan barbet, Slopogon nucalis, or between a Western gorilla, gorilla gorilla, and a platypus, Ornithorhynchus anatinus, or between a red kangaroo, Osphranta rufus, and a baby African bush elephant, Loxodonta africana. Probably because evolution absolutely does not work by bolting on structures from various species onto each other. It was done when Kirk Cameron and Ray Comfort went full crocoduck. Hi, I'm Kirk Cameron. Science has never found a genuine transitional form that is one kind of animal crossing over into another kind, either living or in the fossil record. And there's supposed to be billions of them. Now, what I'm about to show you does not exist. These were actually created by our graphic artists, but I want you to keep your, out, your eye out for this because this is what evolutionists have been searching for for hundreds of years. All right, and if you find one of these, you could become rich and famous. So here's some transitional forms. This is called the crocodile. Oh Can you see this? God, what a numb nut. And it's dumb now. Evolution works by modification of existing structures, especially in macroscopic organisms like animals that have only very limited horizontal gene transfer. That's exactly why the nested hierarchy works, and we don't actually have chimeras like this. Actual chimerical animals like this is what people before evolution expected to see, and that's what they put in their bestiaries and art. Things like lions with snake necks, animals with bird faces and wings, and the bodies of lions, etc. That's the kind of thing intelligent design creates, not evolution. For example, we know cars are intelligently designed, and any two cars by different manufacturers in different lines of different models can simply have the same engine. There's no particular barrier to this. Yet again, we have a creationist asking for evidence of evolution that would actually disconfirm evolution. This argument is usually reserved for low-tier amateur creationists, the kind you get on YouTube, people like Donnie, or one of the mats. Hearing it from a professional creationist PhD is really disheartening. It's like Tompkins decided that simply being bad at addition wasn't enough. He wants you to know that he doesn't even understand genetics, the field he got his degree in. Frankly, it's almost amazing how shameless one man can be. But more, more importantly, we don't see evolution happening in the past. I guess it's that time again. Take it away, Jura Orchestra. Jeez. 
So let's talk about fossils. Let's talk about the fossil record. What do we see in the fossil record? Well, we see sudden appearance. Yes, generally speaking, at the level of genus and species, we see relatively little in the way of transitional forms. There are exceptions, though, such as the genera Triceratops and Thalassochnus, which are both extremely well preserved to the point that the species of these genera simply smoothly transition into one another through the geologic time wherein they are found. But that being said, as we've seen many times, there are many transitional forms. So yes, the coyote appears suddenly, as does, say, the American lion or the American cheetah, but felids as a group do not. We have Proilurus, which is basically the prototypical felid, although it is probably not itself the direct ancestor of all felids. Before that, we have Vivaravians like Simpsonictus, which are based on not just the felids, but also Viverids, the extinct Nimravids, and the Hyenids, etc. Then before that, we get to some of the first carnivorans, like Miasis, which is based on not just the cat-like carnivorans, but also to the dogs, bears, seals, and weasels. Interesting how there are actually transitional forms filling in these gaps between just about anything higher than the genus level. I'll leave it to the audience to say whether Tompkins is uninformed, ill-informed, or dishonest. In other words, different types of creatures, whether it's apes or humans or different kinds of fish or whatever, they all appear suddenly in the fossil record with no evolutionary ancestors. They appear fully formed just like God created them. Really? Well, we just looked at cats. Let's look at humans. Well, we have Homo sapiens, obviously. That's you listening. But to give a short list, we also have H. erectus, H. habilis, but even before the genus Homo emerges, we have earlier transitional forms like Australopithecus, Artipithecus, Aurorans, Sahelanthropus, Oreopithecus, Uranopithecus, Nicolopithecus, etc. That takes us back to the origin of all great apes. But hey, if we just ignore all the transitional forms, then they don't exist. And we also see creatures staying the same, and paleontologists would call this stasis. This just in, everyone. Stabilizing selection pressure is not a thing. Oh. Wait. Yes, it is. Yeah, if an organism remains fit by sticking to its morphology, such that major deviations from the previous morphology is selected against, then it will be morphologically conservative. Evolution has no particular amount of morphological change that it requires over a given period of time. That's why sharks are very little changed, but say, lopefin fish are all over the place, and include things as different as the relatively conservative lungfish and coelacanth, and as highly derived as, well, me and you. But also, who wants to bet that the animals he uses as examples aren't actually as morphologically conservative as to be termed unchanged or in stasis? In other words, a creature will appear suddenly, and then it will stay the same. He's just... Not going to show them now, I guess. Oh well. And in fact, there's many creatures in the fossil record, which I'm going to show you, are hundreds of millions of years old, and they look exactly like their modern living counterparts. That's called stasis. And we don't see any transitional fossils. We don't see one type of critter evolving into a fundamentally different type of creature. There's no transitions going on in the fossil record. Well, again, what's a kind? But also, I guess it's that time again. And so this is Stephen Jay Gould. He was probably one of the most famous evolutionists of the modern era. Uh, he actually died of cancer a few years back. But anyways, he was very outspoken about the reality of the fossil record and the problems that it presented for evolution. And he said this, the extreme rarity, which means absence, <laughs> of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret. 
of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and the nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, in other words, imagination. However reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. Wow. This quote mine again. For the millionth time or something. <sighs> Look, here's Dapper from the past responding to an almost identical quote mine, giving exactly the same response as is needed here. Gould here is complaining that gradualism would predict more transitionals that we find, and that was one of his reasons for suggesting punctuated equilibria, in which new species arrive relatively rapidly, and so we shouldn't expect to see many transitions between closely related species. Also, Gould didn't live to see many of the transitional forms we now have, and he was also aware of many transitional forms, such as Eohippus and Archaeopteryx. Thanks to Skeletor over 9000 for finding that clip for me. And so Stephen Jay Gould was very, uh, even though he was an evolutionist, a diehard evolutionist, he still recognized that there were no transitional forms in the fossil record, and he was a paleontologist. Hmm. Is that what Gould thought? Weird, then, how he also said, quote, since we propose punctuated equilibria to explain trends, it is infuriating to be quoted again and again by creationists, whether through design or stupidity, I do not know, as admitting that the fossil record includes no transitional forms. Transitional forms are generally lacking at the species level, but they are abundant between larger groups. Doesn't seem like he thinks there are no transitional species, does it? Now, I wonder if Jeff here knew that Gould had said that or not. If he did, then he just lied about Gould. Once again, the Ninth Commandment just doesn't count if you're lying for Jesus, I guess. But let me show you what I mean by this. So this is a, a shield bug a fossil, it's supposed to be 50 million years old. It appears suddenly about 50 million years ago. Now I'm, not, I'm just using these, these dates, not because I accept them as being valid, but just to, to prove a point. Uh, and this point I'm trying to talk about is what's called sudden appearance and stasis. Well, look at a modern shield bug that, are, that is alive and well today, and they look exactly the same. No evolution going on there whatsoever. Ah, so Halimorpha halis is just the same as Cicada loe. Hey, you might think that the second generic name sounds familiar. It is. It's the same genus as all those cicadas you might remember. Now, cicadas are members of the superfamily Cicadoidea, in which there are two kinds. So probably not the same as the shield bug if cicadas aren't even similar enough to themselves to be one kind. Shield bugs, on the other hand, are in an entirely different family, Pentatomidae. I don't know, but it feels like cicadas and modern shield bugs aren't really identical. Now, they are similar in some ways, which is why they're both insects in the order Hemiptera, sometimes called the true bugs. Uh, this is a creature that was supposed to have uh, appeared 65 million years ago uh, in, in Cretaceous rock, and evolutionists actually thought that this was the first creature to develop legs and walk on land. Near as I can tell, coelacanths were never proposed as the direct ancestors to tetrapods. Lungfish are closer relatives of tetrapods, and together with the tetrapods and one somewhat ambiguous genus, Styloichthys, make up Ripidistia which excludes coelacanths. They called it, it's the coelacanth. Well, it turned out <coughs> coelacanths were found alive and well in the early 1900s by fishermen. And they weren't even close to land or even walking on land. And again, no one expected to find them on land as their fossils aren't terrestrial. In fact, they're mostly lacustrine and fluvial. That is, the fossil coelacanths are freshwater fish, unlike their living relatives which goes some ways to explaining why we might not have a continuous fossil record of coelacanths through the Cenozoic, even though obviously some of them survived the KPG extinction. Deep marine rock is on the whole younger than continental rock, and since the KPG, we haven't had a whole lot of turnover of deep sea rock being pushed up onto continents. In fact, I'm not aware of any Cenozoic fossil bearing deep sea sediment. On the other hand, we've had plenty of it subduct. As a result of this, and the fact that it's more or less always been this way, deep sea fossils are some of the rarest fossils, and so we will probably never have a good idea of the history of life in the deep oceans, even though surely it's been there the whole time. Unfortunately, for our study of Cenozoic coelacanth, the deep sea is the perfect place not to be picked up in the fossil record. And before you ask, no, that doesn't mean that Megalodon is hiding down there. For one thing, Megalodon is a shallow water species, and for another, it was probably eating whales. That's not easy to come by regularly down in the bottom of the ocean. The Meg just doesn't exist. Actually, they tended to live about 300 feet below the surface of the water, and if they got close to the surface of the water, they would die 
because they're because of the way they're constructed, they had to live deep under the surface. Yeah, adaptations to the deep water tend to make an organism maladapted to shallow water. I'm not sure what is noteworthy about that. Ever seen a blobfish? Did you know that that animal in their natural habitat looks like this? Still, not exactly the best looking fish in the sea, but far from the monstrosity it becomes up on the surface. So what? Deep water coelacanths are in a shocking twist, deep water animals. Now, can you say the same thing about coelacanths found in the Mesozoic River deposits? And so, they weren't even close to walking on land. Again, no one expected them to be walking. They're pretty distant from the ancestors of tetrapods. And they looked exactly the same as they do in the fossils. And so evolutionists called them living fossils. Do they look the same, though? You see, the two modern species of coelacanth are in genus Lanomeria, a genus unknown in the fossil record. Look, here are some examples of coelacanths all but the modern ones from the Mesozoic. Funny how none of them look exactly like the modern coelacanth, except, you know, the modern coelacanth. But further, even if we did have Latimeria fossils from the late Jurassic, or from the Oligocene, or something like that, then what? Evolution doesn't require a certain amount of morphological change. There's no minimum amount of morphological change, or evolution is disproved. So, here's a lobster fossil, supposedly 100 plus million years old. And what does it look like? It looks like lunch. It looks like exactly modern lobsters do. No evolution going on there whatsoever. I guess I'll just say it again. Evolution doesn't require a certain amount of morphological change. There's no minimum amount of morphological change, or evolution is disproved. You notice I keep going back deeper here in evolutionary time. I did notice that, actually. I'm not sure why it matters. Frogs supposedly appeared 350 million years ago and they look exactly like frogs. No evolution there whatsoever. Oh, okay. Let's look at Triodobactrachus, the earliest known frog. Notice that it still has reasonably prominent ribs. It has a tibia and fibula that are both similar in size and robust. It has short metatarsals. It has 13 or so dorsal vertebrae. It has a tail that would have extended past the body wall, and its sacrum is about a third the length of its thorax. Now, a modern frog has a fused tibia and fibula, long metatarsals, about half as many vertebrae, no ribs to speak of, no tail, and a sacrum that is about as long as the thorax. I don't know, looks like a lot of change to me. I guess Jeff is just lying to us, or just doesn't know the first thing about the fossil record of frogs, and so probably shouldn't be talking about it. Neither is really a good look. What about horseshoe crabs? They're alive and well today. A horseshoe crab supposedly first appeared in the Cambrian 400 plus million years ago, and what do they look like? Horseshoe crabs. So the broad group of animals that include fossil so-called horseshoe crabs is Xyphosura. This family is far from the only Xyphosurin family, and it's not the oldest. Take a look at the primitive stem Xyphosurin, Debisterium durgae. Its cephalic shield isn't horseshoe-shaped, its abdomen is still segmented, and it only has a short telson. But under the hood, we find it has many more limbs than a modern horseshoe crab, and those limbs are birimus. That is, they actually have a branch, whereas modern horseshoe crabs have unirimus limbs that do not branch to two. Here's Lunatapsis, the earliest known true Xyphosurin. Notice how the thorax is still segmented distinctly rather than fused into a single piece like in modern horseshoe crabs, and how there are no spines on the fringe of it. Are Xyphosurins a morphologically conservative group of arthropods? Absolutely they are. Have they changed through time nevertheless? Obviously so. And the earliest ones look more basal than the later ones. And the more recent the fossil horseshoe crab, the more it tends to look like modern horseshoe crabs. Anytime a creation shows you a picture of a modern animal and an animal in the fossil record, Find out what the fossil animal is, as well as which animals are the oldest known members of the group in question. Oddly enough, you'll pretty much always find that what they are showing you is a fairly recent fossil, at least in terms of the age of the group in question, and that you can find older fossils showing significant morphological change. Sometimes, you'll find that they're just lying to you about the fossil living organism being the same at all. No evolution going on there whatsoever. Funny, because I'd call going from birimus to unirimus legs, reducing to about half the number of appendages, fusing the abdominal segments, gaining abdominal spines, and the lengthening of the telson for defense and stance recovery purposes counts as evolution. It is certainly not just complete stasis, and it involves the transitional species that Tompkins likes to pretend aren't real. Seriously, finding transitional Xyphosurans is like a Google Scholar search away, but Tompkins already knows that and is lying. Or is just too lazy to see if he's right and doesn't care enough for it to bother him that he's giving unverified information to his audience. And there was nothing leading up to horseshoe crabs that would have been an evolutionary ancestor. They just appeared suddenly in what's called the Cambrian explosion. And they look exactly like they do today. Wait, what about Dibisterium? 
That's exactly what he just said didn't exist, a proto-horseshoe crab. And Lunataspis was a Xyphosurin, and it was also intermediate between Dibisterium and Limulus. I'm pretty sure that counts. Well, these are brittle stars. Brittle stars supposedly appeared 450 million years ago. So here's the thing. I'm not going to show you him just saying no change or whatever. I'm just going to list some transitional echinoderms that show that, yes, echinoderms like brittle stars, sea stars, sea urchins, and crinoids, or sea lilies, have in fact evolved. Oh, look, it's Protoctinus, and Tenocystis, and Tenoimbricata, and Renocytus. All echinoderms that are bilaterally symmetrical, and we know they're echinoderms because of their echinoderm skeletons and chemistry. That looks like a lot of evolution to me. What's really cool is that scientists or paleontologists have been able to find fossils preserved in amber, and so this is tree sap that, that trapped insects and things, and then hardened. Well, the earliest genus of undisputed scorpion is Paleophonus, which is very much like modern scorpions, but curiously, unlike modern scorpions, all the feet are swept back towards the posterior, almost like we see in aquatic arthropods that swim. And what do you know but spiders, scorpions, and such evolved from aquatic chelicerus, like eurypterids, such as pterygotus, which even has pedipalps used as claws, as we see in scorpions. And again, even if there were no evidence of morphological change in scorpions, evolution doesn't require a particular amount of morphological change. As for crickets, it does seem that their fossil record is spotty, and I'm not aware of proto-crickets, that is, members of a stem cricket group. That may in part be because generally the members of the order Orthoptera, which includes crickets, katydids, grasshoppers, and a few other less well-known groups, by and large, have been doing well since the Jurassic, having surviving members of basically every major group, from the schizodactylids with their primitive wings to the highly derived Choroptipidae which look like leaves. Again, I'm cutting out the bit where he just repeats himself again. Anyways, why do we have fossils anyways all over the earth? Why are there billions of dead, buried things? Oh, it's far more than billions. It's probably more like quadrillions, and that by itself is a problem. There are more fossils on earth than you could possibly fit as living organisms on earth during the same year and some change of the flood. The earth would be covered in a living carpet of algae, cephalopods, insects, etc. The problem for creationists isn't really how to explain the existence of fossils. It's how to explain their absurd abundance under their model. And remember, the Institute for Creation Research says that the flood boundary is well into the Cenozoic. So they also have to account for all those fossils during the flood. At least Answers in Genesis and Creation Ministries International only had to bother with Paleozoic and Mesozoic fossils. In fact, more than 70% of the earth is covered with sedimentary rock, sandstone, limestone, and shale, which is produced by a flood, a global flood. Begging the question a bit, aren't we? Well, let's start with the limestone and the shale. Shale can form rapidly, which could include a flood, but when it does so, it has to flocculate first. That is, the shale grains have to attach themselves onto other grains or together, so that the effective grain size is high enough for the shale grains to settle out rapidly. This is because shale is made of some of the smallest grains there are, and so all things being equal cannot fall out of the water rapidly, because Brownian motion will be enough to almost completely overcome the force of gravity. The problem is that flocules in shale can be seen under a microscope, and much of the fine-grained shale out there is non-flocculated, which precludes it from being a flood deposit. The problem is even worse for limestone. Limestone has a similar problem with settling out as shale does, but it's even worse. We don't know of any examples of flocculated limestone at all. And as for sandstone, sure, some of it is from floods, but some of it is from intertidal zones where we can see the obvious crossbedding caused by daily tides, or from lakes where varbs show that the sediment had to form slowly with time for annual layers to be laid down. Or perhaps most devastatingly, Aeolian sandstone is sandstone deposited by wind under open air, which is rather the opposite of a flood. And this stuff is found all over the place, such as the Coconino sandstone, or the sandstone where the famous fighting dinosaurs were found. That's Paleozoic and Mesozoic, respectively. Smack in the middle of a global flood under both CMI and ICR's models. And of course, we know that in the scriptures, there was a global flood about 4,300 years ago, and it killed all life on earth, except for what was in the ark with Noah and, and, and a lot of water creatures. Now, if we were able to know that, it would first have to be true, and we know it's not. Then we would have to have a justifiable reason to believe it. There are none. Some people believe in a global flood, but no one knows there was a global flood, and many people know there was not such a global flood. The fact that, for the Bible tells me so, is something some people find a good reason, neither makes it one, nor does it make their interpretation of the Bible somehow real life. In fact, we have marine fossils at the tops of mountains. Why is that? Oh good, Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins doesn't know what the hell a mountain is. Mountains are formed primarily by two processes. 
One is uplift from magmatic activity, such as volcanism, but also upwelling from the mantle can push parts of the crust up without there being actual volcanoes. The other big one is folding. When bits of continental crust crash into each other, the granitic and sedimentary bits tend to buckle and fold up, while the basaltic bottom layers can go on to be subducted. This is because granite is lighter than basalt, and so it's more buoyant on the mantle than the basaltic crust of the oceans. There is also post-glacial rebound, where glaciers push the crust into the mantle, and then their retreat causes the crust to rebound over the course of millennia, but that is fairly minor and tends not to form mountains. So, since mountains form by taking things low on the Earth up into high elevations, if the low things were under the water, even if they were just a part of the continental shelves, then of course you get marine rock up on mountains. How else could mountains work? And of course, recent volcanoes don't have all these marine rocks, since they're formed directly on the continents, as what are essentially blisters, where the existing continental rock buckles up because of the underlying pressure of the hot and relatively light magma. The only way that marine sediment in mountains could possibly be surprising, given the current scientific knowledge, is if you just ignore what they are in the first place. It's because the entire Earth was flooded uh, at one point in time. Hmm. Then how do we explain all those things on mountains that can't form under a flood, like evaporites, which form when huge volumes of water evaporate over a long time, or limestone, or subaerial ash that happens when a volcano explodes and the ash goes into the air only to settle onto the ground as an ash deposit? Or what about alien sandstone, which is windborne and is anything but rare? Sure, I guess you could explain marine deposits on a mountain with a flood, even though those should be the first areas to have the flood deposits eroded off, being the tallest areas. But even ignoring that, what about all the non-flood deposits? Too bad those absolutely preclude a flood. And floods aren't needed to get marine deposits, even onto the highest mountains, once you realize at the basic level what a mountain is. Only cataclysmic processes can account for the many types of the geological features that we see all over the Earth, including all of the billions of dead buried things or the fossils. Nope, as I've already gone over, cataclysmic events can account for some of those things, but absolutely cannot account for others. Many things like lake farves are evident all over the geological record and absolutely cannot form catastrophically. Also, isn't this guy a geneticist? Why is he being trotted out to lie about geology? And on top of that, we see lots of organic matter and soft tissues in these fossils, which I'll talk about a little bit later, which indicates that they were not buried millions of years ago, but just a few thousand years ago. They don't, but I won't get into it until he does. So we have these massive fossil graveyards all over the world, and they're in flood-formed sedimentary rock. Going to need a citation of that, especially since we know of many fossil graveyards that were certainly not formed that way such as ashfall beds, which is, you know, a subaerial ashfall, as the name implies. So that's how, how do you create a fossil? What happens when something dies out in the woods or, or out, out in nature? It basically rots and decomposes, right? So to create a fossil, you have to bury something very quickly and then compress it with a lot of pressure, and that's how you form a fossil. No, that's one way to make a fossil, a compressed, permineralized fossil. Now, that's a fairly common kind, but we also get fully 3D fossils where there is no such compression. So that part is optional. Also, we have to ask what it means to be buried quickly. Ultimately, it means before the organism in question rots away and there's nothing to preserve. But how fast is that? Well, it turns out it varies widely. But let's hold on to that for a second. Because otherwise, creatures out in nature would just disappear eventually through decomposition. So let's get back to fast enough now. He's right that you have to be buried before you rot to nothing if you're going to be a fossil. But how fast is that? We know of natural mummies in the deserts of the world, like the mummies of Peru, that are simply mummies because of the desert climate. There are the mummies of various animals of Lake Natron. There are subfossils all over Madagascar, etc. So fossils are forming right now. You see, it takes different amounts of time for a given organism to decompose depending on local environments. If the local environment is very dry, very salty, low in oxygen, or just undergoing rapid deposition, any of these can result in the organism being buried, whether quickly or not on a human timescale, and then a fossil forming. And in fact, fossils show mass mortality like something really catastrophic happened to them. So this is a uh, marine reptile, a Kykiosaurus, and this is in, in the Triassic uh, system. And as you can see, these marine reptiles in that one picture were all buried in mass together. They were all buried suddenly as they were swimming around. Well, this is a bit frustrating. With no citation, I can't tell where this find is from, so I can't tell how it formed. 
It sure looks like it could be some cataclysmic event at first glance, but that's not how science works, by just eyeballing it. But interestingly, Caecosaurus is itself a transitional form between basal archosauromorphs and later sauropterygians like plesiosaurs. It's from the Zuganpo Formation in southern China. That formation is primarily made of limestone, so we have a problem already as limestone deposits best under warm, tranquil water, which isn't what I'd associate with a violent global flood. So we don't have a flood deposit, and not only that, it's from a low oxygen area as evidenced by the relative lack of burrows and the dark color of the limestone. Exactly the kind of place where things decay slowly. Turns out, this is a deep water limestone deposit from just below the photic zone. There are no indications of flooding, such as larger stones dropped by a flood, grading in the bedding, or other indications of high energy deposition. I'd love to comment on the fossils actually on screen, but I can't since not only are they unsighted, searching for the organism doesn't bring up that picture, nor does a reverse image search. And then we have trilobites uh, from the Devonian period, which were just buried heaps upon heaps of trilobites, buried rapidly and quickly all at once. I did manage to find a source on this trilobite picture. Unfortunately, the source is Alamy, a picture licensing website. To ICR's credit, it does seem that they have paid for this picture, rather than just taking it watermarks and all. Unfortunately, neither the version they use nor the other version on Alamy with the whole slabs says what genus of trilobite this is, where it was found, or even if it's real. Also, somewhat embarrassingly, Alamy spells trilobite with a Y as if it were some measurement of data, like kilobyte. They look like the lower Devonian protidian trilobite Homoproteus. Unfortunately, this genus is common all over the place, and so I can't say much about the deposition or even veracity of this fossil slab. It might not even be real. But don't worry, because in an effort to say that all fossils apparently come in big graveyards, even though most of them are just isolated body parts, Tompkins pulled the first image of a lot of trilobites he could find, and doesn't, as near as I can tell, even himself know. So all I can really say is, yeah, maybe some trilobites in the Devonian died in like an underwater landslide or something. I don't know. That's not really evidence for a global flood. And so we see this sort of thing all over the Earth. Yeah, there are fossil beds in lots of places, but there are also lots of things that couldn't be deposited by a flood. The thing is, just the bare existence of fossil graveyards doesn't really help us discriminate between the scientific view of the fossil record and the creationist view of the same. Both would result in fossil graveyards, so it doesn't really matter that they exist. We need to find something that discriminates between the models, such as things like the presence of rocks that couldn't be formed by a flood where we would need the flood to be. Unfortunately for flood geology, those things are found all over the world. And on top of that, we know that this that these foss this fossilization process occurred very quickly because not only do we see these massive uh, fossil graveyards, but we see stuff that that decomposes very quickly being fossilized. You know what happens to flowers out in your yard after a few days when they die? They disappear, right? Well, we know that based on fossil flowers that we see in sedimentary rocks that they were buried rapidly and quickly in a massive cataclysm. Okay, so let's look at these plants. On the left is Chinea tenuis, specimen FOBU11466. The middle fossil is unidentified. And the last is from the Onigen Quarry on Lake Constance. These are all Green River Formation fossils, and the Green River Formation is an Eocene formation. So this puts it after the flood for most creationists, and in the receding period of the flood for the Institute of Creation Research. So what's the formation made of? Oh, well, you know, sandstones, mudstones, siltstones, oil shales, coal beds, and, oh wait, saline evaporites and lacustrine limestone and dolomites. Hmm, not sure how we're going to get that during a flood. Whoops. Well, those two were a bust. What about the P. macrantha fossil? Oh right, it's in more limestone. You know, one of those rocks that can't really form in a flood without flocculation, but which we've never seen with flocules. So gee, none of these could even be from a worldwide flood, because just the locations where they were found preclude a worldwide flood when they formed. That's rough for flood geology, but it's also basically always how it goes. And even such things that don't have skeletons even left their signatures in the fossil record and were buried rapidly and catastrophically, like octopus fossils and squid fossils. Literally all I can find about these pictures is that they're from Lebanon, and an artist drew a life reconstruction of one of them using the preserved ink you can see in the fossil as the ink for her drawing, which is pretty cool. Unfortunately, nothing that I could find would give me the formation the octopus were found in, a genus name, or anything else that I could use. And I feel like I don't need to tell this to my audience, but Lebanon isn't really enough to go on to identify a specific fossil. And then we see stuff like this where creatures were literally buried in the act of, here we have a fish eating another fish, and on the bottom there, we have an ichiosaur giving live birth and buried catastrophically while it was giving birth. An ichiosaur, huh? 
So I'm actually not all that picky about pronouncing scientific names. My rule of thumb is give every consonant and vowel a reasonable pronunciation and don't skip any of them. This is an ichthyosaur. And what about these indicate sudden death? Fish die trying to bite into other fish that are too big for them and then getting stuck with their dorsal spines. Pregnant animals die and animals die in childbirth. So I'm not sure why these are frozen moments in time and not just normal causes of death that have always been happening. And in fact, in the case of the ichthyosaur, I happen to know it was buried in fine-grained shale with no mention of flocculation. That's because it's Denopterygius, an early Jurassic ichthyosaur from the Posidonia Shale in Germany, and that's what that shale is. So it really didn't die in a giant flood. It died in calm waters. So this tells us that, that Noah's flood uh, is true. It, just, it was a violent, cataclysmic uh, process that created these things. Did you notice how he didn't even try to justify that statement? I noticed. Uh, this is one of my favorite fossils, and it's kind of hard to tell what's going on there, but there's a schematic kind of showing what's going on, and this is actually from National Geographic. So here's what an artist did to represent uh, what was going on in those fossils I just showed you. Basically, it was a snake was in the uh, nest of a sauropod and eating the eggs and the young baby sauropods, and it was buried in the act. Always fun when the only citation given is just National Geographic, and the links on their own article are so old that they're broken. Really makes it easy to check up on this. Anyway, it is in fact something I managed to trace down and actually found, you know, a real peer-reviewed paper. Shocking that I would go to the primary literature, I know. So this snake is Sanaja indicus, and it's from the Lametta Formation. What's that made up of? Oh, you know, clay, siltstone, and sandstone fasces deposited in fluvial and lacustrine conditions, so it's not flood deposits. But let's zoom in more on this fossil, which is undoubtedly cool. This probably was in fact a catastrophic burial where a nearshore rise in the landscape fell in a landslide, covering the snake and sauropod eggs. Of course, the question of how it is that if the Jurassic is the final bits of the rising flood as ICR believes, that this behavior is preserved, since what is a sauropod doing laying a nest in a flood, and what is a snake doing slithering along the bottom when it's supposed to be drowning? See, this only makes sense if it's happening towards the beginning of the flood. But ICR's own flood model indicates that it's happening in the highest part of the flood where everything should already be dead. That's because nothing about flood geology makes even a lick of sense. Really, I want you to think about this. ICR here is telling you that when the flood is reaching its highest levels, at the bottom of the flood, a sauropod laid a nest underwater. Those eggs, apparently, had time to develop, at least to the point where they were about ready to hatch. And, again, at the bottom of the worldwide flood, at its deepest point, a snake slithered by, underwater to eat these underwater eggs laid underwater by a sauropod only then for sediment to come and cover it so that it could be preserved predating on underwater eggs. I don't know if I can explain how completely absurd that entire idea is. But another interesting thing uh, with fossils, we know that they weren't buried millions of years ago because we have this soft tissue present in them. So this is actually tissue from the bone of a T-Rex and it's soft and it's springy. Except it's not tissue, is it? It's degraded proteins such as collagen, which is already one of the most stable proteins in the world and has been cross-linked with iron, vastly increasing its stability, which is the same mechanism of preservation that allows leather to last so long and that makes organisms in formaldehyde last essentially indefinitely. And on top of that, they found blood cells that were intact in these T-Rex bones. And there's actually a blood cell inside a blood vessel. And this is all published in the secular, you know, the secular literature. As a quick hint, that's not the scientific literature. Smithsonian Magazine is cool and all, but it's not peer-reviewed science. Also, despite the label, this is from Dr. Mary Schweitzer, 2006, and she is very clear that she cannot say that she has blood cells, but that what she has is consistent with such an identification, but the evidence at the time was lacking. If Tompkins has more evidence indicating it is a blood cell, I sure wish he'd mention it. Now let's get a quick quote from the very article Tompkins is referencing. Quote, Schweitzer's research has been hijacked by young earth creationists who insist that dinosaur soft tissue couldn't possibly survive millions of years. They claim her discoveries support their belief based on their interpretation of Genesis, that the earth is only a few thousand years old. Of course, it's not unusual for paleontologists to differ with creationists, but when creationists misrepresent Schweitzer's data, she takes it personally. She describes herself as a complete and total Christian. On a shelf in her office is a plaque bearing an Old Testament verse, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. End quote. Hmm, what's this? Dr. Schweitzer is herself a Christian? Oh, 
And what that quote doesn't tell you is that she was a young Earth creationist herself until she studied paleontology. I wonder what else is in this very article that Tompkins is referencing. Well, a little later on, we have this, quote, Young Earth creationists also see Schweitzer's work as revolutionary, but in an entirely different way. They first seized upon Schweitzer's work after she wrote an article for the popular science magazine Earth in 1997 about possible red blood cells in her dinosaur specimens. Creation Magazine claimed that Schweitzer's research was powerful testimony against the whole idea of dinosaurs living millions of years ago. It speaks volumes for the Bible's account of a recent creation. This drives Schweitzer crazy. Geologists have established the Hell Creek Formation, where B. rex was found, is 68 million years old, and so are the bones buried in it. She's horrified that some Christians accuse her of hiding the truth of her data. They treat you really bad, she says. They twist your words and they manipulate your data. End quote. Gee, sure seems like what Dr. Schweitzer is complaining about is exactly what's going on here. And I also want to note that creationists didn't pick up on this entire find until 1997 when it was published in the secondary literature, the non-peer review literature. Because of course, creationists don't spend a whole lot of time checking the primary literature because that would be too much like doing science. And we all know that science has nothing to do with young earth creationism. Even these bone cells called osteocytes that had those little finger-like uh, projections called philopodia, which are very sensitive, and, and they were buried, obviously, very quickly and only a few thousand years ago. How is any of that obvious? Oh, right. It isn't. These are still intact, these, these osteocyte bone cells. In fact, no, they're not intact. No more than leather is just the same as intact skin. So it's really amazing, all of this tissue uh, that has been found in fossils that should not be there if they were millions of years old. Oh, so we're not going to actually mention any preservation methods or counter-arguments, any of that. Cool, just bald assertions, misrepresentations, and then we move on. Sounds about right for a creationist talk. So let's look at the geological column. Does it really talk about or, or, or point to evolution? So Yes, in fact, it was one of the first indications of it. You see, faunal succession is a phenomenon in the fossil record that was noticed very early on in the history of paleontology. It is simply the obvious fact that the farther down you go into the geological column, the less like modern life the organisms there tend to be, and the dominant fauna of various geological systems changes. This needed to be explained, and while some explained it with progressive creation, where basically for most of the history of life, Earth was like in God's early access program, he had a lot of updates with some scope creep, various nerfs, buffs, and complete removal from the game of some animals. And finally, with humanity, God released Earth 1.0. Others thought that perhaps there was some naturalistic way that faunal succession had occurred. And so many ideas about evolution were proposed, and many were discarded. But basically, yes, the fossil record so strongly points to evolution that it almost invented the idea on its own. According to uh, evolutionists, in sedimentary rocks, you don't have a whole lot of stuff there where you can radiometrically date things. So they date things by the fossils, and sometimes they date the fossils by the rocks, and it's all circular reasoning. Well, it's true that one can't radiometrically date sedimentary rocks, but you can do so with igneous rocks. And by the law of superposition, you can know if the igneous rock in question is older or younger than the sedimentary rock. And if you can get igneous rock on either side of a sedimentary formation, then you can bracket the age. And if you find the same formation elsewhere without that igneous rock, since it's the same formation, it's got about the same date range. Further, only certain fossils are used as index fossils. Those that have a narrow vertical range, but a wide horizontal extent. That means only organisms that lived all over the place, but only for a short time. This gives only relative dates on its own, and only in conjunction with the whole geological column, which was first developed on the basis of the aforementioned law of superposition which states that in undisturbed rocks, the higher rocks are newer than the lower rocks, which makes sense, since where deposition occurs is at the surface. So superposition and index fossils are used to get relative dates for rocks, that is, which ones are older and younger. Radiometric dating is used to provide absolutely benchmark dates that allow us to anchor points in this relative dating to real ages, and all of those lines up as predicted by an old Earth operating under natural processes in the way expected by real geology. Nothing is actually circular, it's just that it's more complicated than the average fifth grader might grasp easily, and since we know Tompkins is at about that intellectual level, in terms of math at least, perhaps that's where he is in terms of geology too. But in short, no, it's not circular to use index fossils. But they claim, they claim that, oh, life evolved, you know, from creatures in the ocean, and then these creatures went to land, and then from land, and so on and so forth. But really is what the geological column tells us is that stuff was buried by ecosystems. 
Odd, since floods today characteristically jumble up ecosystems, and even recently, such a mixture of different ecosystems was used to identify an actual fossil site caused by catastrophic flooding caused by a tsunami. This is the Tanis fossil site in North Dakota, where elements of marine, freshwater, and terrestrial organisms were found in a formation that normally has animals from freshwater streams. This area seems to have tsunami, which is rock deposited by tsunami, and part of the reason for saying this is very catastrophic flooding. But even without a tsunami, floods push debris primarily with their headwater, and the debris tends to just pile up at the headwaters, such that when all is said and done, any debris collected just tends to get mostly jumbled and dumped into the area the flood stopped. There's no careful ecological zonation. So we know the global flood happened over a year-long period. We can read that in the book of Genesis. That's where we get the claim, not the evidence. Making the claim isn't sufficient to show the claim is true. So what would be buried first in that kind of a progressive flood? Well, marine creatures, right? Didn't he say they were supposed to be safe from this flood somehow? But also no, I'd expect a flood to create a graded deposit sorted not by ecosystem, but by hydrodynamic qualities. So big, heavy things at the bottom, small, light things at the top, which is basically what we see in flood deposits, and what we can see in some actual fossil beds. For example, Summer Rose Weeks, a creationist herself, at least at the time of writing, wrote a paper examining one such find, and discovered that already decayed hadrosaurs had been washed out by a local flood and into a gully where their bones were sorted by size, as that's what floods do. So that's exactly what we see in the fossil record. Okay, but why do we see terrestrial deposits from the Cambrian? There are Aeolian, Fluvial, and Lacustrine Cambrian deposits too, and we have marine deposits all through the column. There are many marine deposits full of marine life from the very tip of the Cenozoic. How is it the flood didn't bury them until so much later if the first thing it buried was sea life? You see, that's the thing. The idea of ecological zonation sounds nice and all, but it doesn't work on just the most basic level when even a bit of critical thought is applied. And its promoters just have to lie by omission to pretend that all our marine fossils are from the Cambrian through the Ordovician or so. And we see all these marine creatures and all the complex body plans associated with them, and many of these creatures are still alive today, showing up in the Cambrian strata, which would be the first uh, flood strata layer. So I guess the Ediacaran organisms are what? Just put in the pre-flood rocks to fool us into thinking that there was evolution? I mean, it even has things that are members of stem groups to modern groups, like Kimberella, which is probably a stem mollusk. Those guys don't count, I guess. And then, and then we see stuff that would be living more in coastal environments and shallow water showing up in the fossil record. Well, that implies that the Cambrian is mostly deep water fossils, but that's just not true. We do have some deep water Cambrian deposits, but also some shallow water deposits too. There's a reason why we have both deep sea eyeless trilobites and shallow water trilobites with amazing eyes. It's because the Cambrian isn't just deep water. But beyond that, we also have non-fossil bearing terrestrial deposits, but he's just going to ignore those. And then in the uppermost layers, in the Cenozoic layers, then we see stuff like mammals and, 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 and insects and angiosperm plants and things that you would expect to be living at higher elevations. Yes, but we also see things like whales, sharks, and such. Why didn't the whales get washed in with like the mosasaurs or even Anomalocaris? Do whales live at high elevation? Not last that I checked. So basically, it's an ecological zonation process of burial. It doesn't point to evolution at all. Yeah, all you need to do is ignore the actual fossil record and look at cartoons for kids to explain it at a middle school level. And in fact, Dr. Kim Clary, a geologist here at ICR, used to work for Chevron. Oh, I'm familiar with Clary. This ought to be good. And he has been mapping uh, these mega sequences. So in the oil and gas industry, they wouldn't call something like the Cambrian uh, they would call it the sock mega sequence, and then so on and so forth. That's weird, because the people I know in the oil industry, and I do know professional petroleum geologists, use the standard names and don't use the names of cratonic sequences, which is what these are really called in science. But anyways, they correspond to sequences in the geological column, and he has literally mapped out the global flood over uh, North America, South America, Europe, Africa, and now he's working through Asia. He's not, though. He's going and noticing places with widespread deposition that can be correlated, which is to say he's just redoing the science that led humans to discover things like Pangaea, Gondwana, Laurasia, etc. It's not remarkable, it's not new, and it's not making any impact whatsoever on science. And he has shown in his research that, that the marine uh, creatures were buried first, and then creatures from coastal lowlands, and then creatures at higher elevations, and it makes perfect sense. It's just common sense. Except it just isn't true. Too bad that, but we should leave the rest of this for part three. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, hit the like button. 
If you didn't, tell me what you didn't like in the comments and hit the dislike button. Either way, I hope that you hit the subscribe button and use the bell icon to turn on all notifications so you're always alerted when I have new content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Bent Hovind, Tapioca Weasel, Denny5252, Ian Chen, Landon Knoll, Mabity Babity, San, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, Eloran Teller, Dr. Tapioca Weasel, and Pat L. Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is. And perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get an access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.